I watched uh, Rawns the other night, and uh, how old were you on that shoot? Uh, I was 35. Don't mind asking, 35. Yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd like to know how old we all were because I kept being astounded by how young everybody looked. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that was a fairly early time team for you. What was it like arriving on a time team shoot for not the first time because you've been an Anglo-Saxon expert, but you played a big role in that. What was it like being in that intense process? Well, I, I think it might have been my first complete three day that I'd done. So the full uh, production meeting, hotel, drinks, everything. Uh, <laughs> and what was weird about it was that I was I was the only new person everybody else was was it this like well-oiled machine and so to begin with it was difficult to know how I fitted in I mean it was quite difficult to know how I fitted in for years in some ways but the the thing that I kept thinking watching it again uh, last night was um, that I had no idea of the capabilities of Time Team and, and I it was obvious that I'd asked for a massive great big trench and people were saying things like you know not sure we can do that in the time available and I was thinking but you've got huge machines and there's all these people you know I didn't realize that all the people were already quite busy and that I couldn't just demand loads of people to strip a whole area of allotments even though that's that's the way that you do an Anglo-Saxon cemetery if you want to understand the whole thing I hadn't quite matched what I wanted to do with 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 what was possible in three days and um, I remember a fairly alarming moment for me, which was when I think you showed me some pictures of Anglo-Saxon settlements. And you made the point that, that here were all these burials. And yet, if we were in between a couple, we could dig large numbers of holes and miss them all. And, and we eventually found some. How was that process for you, that the doubt and then the final discovery? Uh, well, the doubt was very frustrating because, yes, as, as you say, I think most people uh, um, in modern life look at a churchyard or a cemetery um, today and realise it is absolutely packed full of graves. You've only got a certain um, area to work in and you have to bury all your people in it so it tends to get very very intensively used in the anglo-saxon period that's not what happened um, we I, as i was pointing out to carenza in the program we don't have boundaries for these things which is really weird how do you live in a landscape where there aren't boundaries and also we don't know who was deciding to put them where we don't know what factors were underlying it and for a cemetery that didn't get used for hundreds of years you might only be seeing people who were buried quite well spaced out and, and I was thinking of the size of the garden and I was thinking of the size of the graves and the size of the trenches and the amount of land that might be in between and I was just thinking this I'm here as an advisor I can't I can't not say you might not find any I, I've got I've got to come up with the goods. There was quite a lot of pressure um, because I I didn't know how to come up with the goods, but I felt that I ought to be able to because I was uh, not just the most junior person, but I was also the expert, and that was really scary for me as well as you. Um, what What was the moment that you sort of crossed the Rubicon and suddenly? we began to find in all the areas in a way we began to find those burials was it day three that that, that happened oh that's a good question i think it might have been oh i don't know that is a good question um yes i think it might have been or it might have been very late on day two uh, because of course the one that phil was digging you had a, we had a grave cut for so you knew that you you had a grave for coming down onto any bones so that was a cheering moment when you thought well actually there's probably a grave here but i'm not totally sure which day it was and we were looking at anglo-saxon graves and we've done quite a few of them on time team and the sheer delight that Tony has in the fact that if we're doing an Anglo-Saxon grave, there's a reasonable chance we'll find some stuff in it. Um, and how do you see the reason for that stuff? Here with the Anglo-Saxons, they were burying someone. And why did they collect all those things? around? What, how, what's your theory about why that was going on? 
Well, I remember a very, very early time team that I watched where Tony got into, um, well, he might have got into a grave or he might just have laid, laid down on the soil and he said, this is me dead. This is me in a grave. Look, what, what would you find? You'd find the rivets on my jeans. You'd find the zip. You'd find my glasses. That was when he was still wearing glasses. Um, You'd, you'd find these things that I'd, I, I'd take for the afterlife, you know, all my kit, you might find my radio and, and a pen and that kind of thing. And I remember getting really irritated by this and thinking, no, no, they should have a, they should have a, a, a proper Anglo-Saxon expert on who can say that this isn't equipment for the afterlife. Because you never find, well, you very rarely find tools. You never find anything agricultural. You never find a spade, for instance. Um, it's a very specific kit which shows things about you. It shows your age and your sex. Um, and we can check those from the bones. Um, it shows your status as a, as a warrior, um, and whether that's real, you know, whether you really were a warrior or whether you just like to think of yourself as one. It could also show your status as um, something like, um, something like a, a woman who's good with textiles now, or, or she's of a class that should be good with textiles, or she's of a type that, that symbolically wove things like the peace weavers who might be the antidote to the warriors. So it, it's, it, it's, a, it's a kit that, that is saying very subtle things about you. They may not have understood everything it was saying about you. And we are one further removed and we probably don't understand it either. But there's masses to decode in these and it's not as simple as just having, um, as just equipment for the afterlife. I, I remember, I think it was Winterbourne, that film, and we put his mobile phone in with him. Uh, That's it. Which would have been really handy if the Anglo-Saxons had had some sort of analogue equivalent. Our Lady that we found, can you remember the moment you first saw Victor's drawing? Did you see it on the site or was it later when you watched the programme of, of, the, of the woman? Well, I, I, the, the one that I really clearly remember is the picture of Henry, the original um, chap. The, the picture of the woman with the dog, I think I must have either seen it at the absolutely last minute or uh, or just on, when I watched the programme. Um, because the thing that I remember about the appearance of the woman is that um, our reenactor had exactly the same necklace on. So um, I think that must have been one of those things that we either didn't manage to film or didn't make the cut in the end. Because I had a long chat with her about, about how come she had been so... Um, uh, I don't know, uh, she'd been like a, a, a psychic and managed to bring the precise thing that was required and to wear it. I think that's what we used to call time team luck. Yes. And, and I remember the moment when Phil, with a tiny dental pick, took out those rings. And I realised that without that amount of care that he took, we could have easily just lost those. They were incredibly fad, fragile little rings. And, it, and that moment when he pulled out the bead. How did you feel when you saw things like the cooking pot coming up from that trench? It seems to be a mixture of decorative, the sort of things that you'd loved in life. And then in her grave, near the head, we found a cooking pot. What's going on there? Well, she had a lot of things near her head. Um, which I found surprising um, that a pot is generally put by the head and we don't know why. Um, it, I suppose the space by the head in a, in a tightly packed grave um, and uh, it may have been that a pot contained something special. Um, the pot was more there as the container for whatever's inside it um, than it is as, as a container in its own right. So whatever it might have been, food, drink, medicine, um, something liquidy, um, the, it, it's, it's there near your mouth, near your head, near your brain, um, maybe that's why. But there were other things that shouldn't have been by her head. So one of the things that happened um, in the edit uh, was that uh, the, the bone disc, in fact it probably almost certainly was an antler disc, um, that was on her shoulder that was labeled as a brooch now it's not a brooch it's something that normally hangs at your waist but with her it was up by her head and there was there was too much by her head 
um, I, I, I'd like to think more about that, um, to, to, to have a look at the drawings and see exactly where the, the beads and the wire making the necklace was and to see whether things could have been shaken up moved up towards the head because there was a void uh, so if you tilt a coffin things can slide up now that would be evidence for a coffin or a or a beer that's being used to support the body and that's the kind of discovery that you make in post excavation and i remember you made a really interesting point that the stain on the skull which i think was uh, had come from bronze or copper that sort of led you to a few thoughts because there are a number of stains on the bones and, and why was that useful to you? Stains on the bones are just brilliant because if uh, uh, they don't happen in all soil types so they need a specific um, microclimate to, to occur but if you have a grave that's not recorded in the standard way or that has been disturbed before it can be uh, recorded thoroughly. Um, the objects that are in contact with the bones can corrode and leave this stain. Uh, iron can be difficult to see uh, because there's so much iron in soil anyway. Um, silver it can be difficult because again, it's gray, it's not easy. Bronze or any kind of copper alloy has this bright, bright green and it's brilliant because it, it gives you a, a good, thorough, precise fixing of a location on, on the bone. Um, but having something on the back of the head is really unusual um, and it's probably related to this container being by the head business um, and, and containers, of course, are mostly organic and just have little repair patches and clips and that kind of thing. Um, that can be made out of copper alloy. And how rare is it for you to find an Anglo-Saxon burial with a pet buried at the feet? It's very rare. It's not unheard of. There is one with a crow or, or something like that, jackdaw, magpie, a corvid, and of course they make quite good pets. Uh, I know of another dog, but I don't think that was buried in a in the grave with somebody. I think that is absolutely, you know, extraordinary. And in fact, that's one of those things that you could find out by simply combing through lots of excavation reports, but nobody's got the time to comb through all these excavation reports. So if anyone's sitting at home with a library of excavation reports and doesn't know what to do with themselves during lockdown, and you can probably find most of these things on, on the internet now, um, the Archaeology Data Service or East Anglian Archaeology Reports, they're all online. And, and when they're online, of course, you can do control F and type dog and, and you'll find them. So someone who doesn't mind going through lots of pitch blend to find their radium, so to speak, could find out for us. The one that I think is really interesting, though, is there are dogs, but there are no cats. What is going on with the cat in Anglo-Saxon England? When I think of dogs in prehistory, I think of hunting dogs, hounds, big brutish animals. And this was a classic little toy, almost like a toy lap dog, dog terrier, unless it was a puppy, of course. And that was a tremendously, um, there was something moving about the relationship between that woman and her favorite pet just curled round her feet. Yes, and it's a, a, when you start thinking about that, you begin to be wondering about what what happened that the woman and the dog died at the same time. Uh, we we tend to think of graves as being kind of like photographs, and we forget that something else has to have happened before you take this photograph. Both of the people in this grave, both of the of the beings in this grave, have to be dead, and it's unlikely that a person would die at the same time as their pet, unless something really awful and tragic has happened. And then often, you know, if it's an accident, you can often see it on the bones. You know, somebody will will be injured. Say, you know, these days, groups of people tend to die in things like traffic accidents. So, if you're going to say, well, this is a woman and her pet, then you've got to try to find a something that might have happened for them both to die at the same time and yet it not to be visible on the bones and you've got to find a story for that and it's not easy um, but going back to the to the smallness of the dog um, of course one of the uses of small dogs is literally as lap dogs and they keep you warm in a cold climate a dog sits on your lap and it keeps you warm but 
uh, it tend, they, they tend to be used for old people. You can keep an old person warm quite effectively with a dog, uh, but she wasn't particularly old, was she, Our Lady? So I, I really don't know what's going on there. But it's similar to when people, there's two people in a grave together and people say, oh, look, a couple. Well, what was it that caused that couple to die at the same time? Or a, a woman and a, and a baby. And they say, oh, well, maybe uh, mother and child. But w unless it's actually in childbirth, mothers and babies don't usually die at the same time. So you need to find another explanation. And as we reach that final moment, what was lovely about, I think, that film, which in many ways for me was a sort of classic time team combination of things. There were some lovely shots. I think Dennis, the cameraman, um, did some shots of you and Carenza together, which was lovely. And Tony, they were just quite, quite contemplative moments. But we had the virtue of having the woman who was interested. He wasn't an archeologist and she wanted that picture of that face. How did you feel when we finally got the, Victor did that wonderful drawing? Did you see that during the shoot? I did see it during the shoot. It, it was a, a very momentous um, thing because, uh, because Pat's reaction was so, um, so great. But I think we'd all had that kind of reaction because um, Victor always has brought such humanity to his drawings. Um, it, it marks him out from the kind of run-of-the-mill archaeological reconstruction artist because he's a he 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 does figures he does he does horses he does humans he does people he does he he, he doesn't just do buildings and and artifacts and landscapes so um, the that we'd all seen the skull and I'd been so amazed by the work that um, that David Whittaker had done on the on the teeth and so on so we knew exactly how old he was uh, we knew he had these amazing high cheekbones um, and it had not escaped any of us that he actually looked rather like Morris Pat's husband um, and, and so that gave you another little frisson that um, that that here was a ma the man who'd who'd helped to find him, uh, who was a rather similar looking man to the to the man who was buried there, and it gives you a sense of kind of continuity over the centuries.